Shalom. Welcome to Understanding the World with Rabbi David Kaufman. I'm joined in the studio by Mark Finkelstein, Jewish Community Relations Director for the Jewish Federation of Greater Des Moines. Later on in our show today, we'll be joined by Arnold Roth, uh, who is an anti-terrorism activist, uh, researcher, and writer. Um, he He's also a uh, a lawyer and consultant to many Israeli uh, technolo- uh, technology companies, and he uh, he is a uh, uh, a benefactor uh, whose family created the Karen Malky Foundation to help families with special needs children take care of their children at home. Um, Arnold Roth can speak about some or all of that uh, later on our show today. I'd like to thank Dr. Ronald Bergman. Uh, for his generosity uh, uh, in uh, sponsoring our show in uh, Bergman Folker's Cosmetic Surgery and Spa. Uh, And um, this week, the major topic of discussion, I think, pretty much all around the world, uh, is uh, what happened uh, in Boston and um, the nature of the two individuals who have been uh, seen as responsible for this event. It's possible that there are others involved at some level, uh, perhaps influencing um, the Sarnay of brothers to uh, go about and doing this and, and potentially to who have who worked on educating them or radicalizing them. Um, but as far as actually carrying out uh, the bombing in Boston, we know that it was simply the two brothers. Um, there have been a lot of discussions as to who these people are. Uh, we know that uh, Tamerlan, the older brother, uh, spent some time in Russia, in, in uh, Chechnya and Dagestan, where he was from, uh, and that he clearly has been, over the last couple of years, preaching uh, a, a form of radical Islam um, and became what they call radicalized, meaning that he became kind of an angry militant, basically, uh, and um, was hateful of other uh, of others, period. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had Carl Wilkins on this show who was talking about uh, caring about others is, and, and, and hating others being the, the uh, hating others being the cause of genocide and, and many problems in the world. Well, this is a, this is a person who became hateful of others. Um, not only did he uh, carry out this terrorist attack in Boston, but there's possibility that he uh, was involved in um, the killings of three Jews who were uh, friends of his, or at least one of whom he considered to be a close friend at some point. Um, the FBI is now investigating that along with the, um, the Boston police because those killings took place in 2011 and he was related to them. Uh, one of the, the things that's, that struck me um, over the last few days is an attempt by uh, some in the media uh, to portray Tamerlan and Jokhar Tsarnaev as victims of oppressive American society, of, of Islamophobia, you, you name it, um, and just about anything. Um, and, and part of what that is is to try to make it seem more uh, uh, understandable what they did. If they're victims... Um, then their hatred of others makes more sense. If this really is based in a radicalization of their religious beliefs, that's much more problematic. Because if you wanted to argue that religion couldn't cause people to do this, and that certainly Islam couldn't cause people to do this kind of action, it's much more difficult to do that if you have evidence that two Americans... The, the two people who are living in America for years, who are participating in American society, who have American friends. I mean, when, when Tamerlan Sarnayev said that he didn't have American friends, a number of the people who knew him well said, what the heck is he talking about? He had lots of friends. These guys were popular. He and his brother were both popular among the people that they hung out with. They were not ostracized. People did not criticize them over their religion. They did not treat them any differently than anybody else. They participated in their gym. They participated in the dorm. They were invited to parties. These people were popular. So for them to claim that, that for anybody to claim that these brothers were ostracized in any way does not seem to be justified, does not seem to be supported by the facts that we know. Um, what we do know is that at some point, the older brother became radicalized 
potentially along with his younger brother, but it's also possible that the younger brother simply became radicalized by the older brother. Uh, we don't know. Um, and uh, that will come out in the questioning of Jokart Sarnaev. To that, we found out um, today, in fact, that, uh, uh, that the FBI was questioning Jokar Sarnaev on Monday uh, in the middle, uh, about a few hours, I think 16 hours, into their 48-hour um, American security uh, exemption window uh, during which they, could, they can ask before he's read his Miranda rights. The FBI said it was getting good information from Jokar Sarnaev before um, the Justice Department stepped in uh, sent a federal magistrate to read him his Miranda rights uh, and did so without even telling the FBI. So there is now a firestorm of criticism of the Department of Justice, um, if nothing else, for simply not informing or even consulting the FBI before they went about reading him his Miranda rights. Um, the possibility is that Eric Holder, um, the Director of, of Justice, uh, wanted to make sure that everybody knew that this was going to be treated as a federal crime and not some sort of um, it, with a military tribunal or something like that. But in the meantime, by acting without consulting um, the relevant security uh, apparatus in the United States, um, he may well have done harm acting so quickly and without consultation. Uh, but even if, he'd, even if he said, I'm in a disagreement with the FBI, I'm in disagreement with the CIA, I don't really care that you don't want this to happen, I want to go through with it, that conversation should have happened. It should not have happened that the Department of Justice shows up in the middle of a Federal Bureau of Investigation investigation into terrorism and shuts it down without even talking to them. That doesn't seem right, and I think a number of uh, the Congress people are very upset about that. Uh, and um, it, we'll probably see hearings. In fact, we're, we're definitely going to see hearings dealing with this specific information um, uh, happening on Capitol Hill. Um, that's basically the layout of what's happening this week. There are a number of other things that have happened uh, around the world, uh, and um, we will talk more about them in, coming, in, in, in the coming weeks. Uh, those are the big issues, and that is understanding the world, the world in five minutes. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Drink, dance, party. Kitties is the ultimate dance club in Des Moines. A huge dance floor with room to move, three bars to keep your drinks full, and kicking DJs playing all your favorite dance music. At Kitties, we've always got your birthday party planned with birthday Fridays. That's right, when your birthday rolls around, there's only one place to go. Gather up your friends and head to Kitties, where you drink free on the Friday of your birthday week. Find out more about birthday Fridays at kittiesusa.com. Kitties, all kinds of people, all kinds of music, all kinds of fun. Drug and alcohol addiction slowly steals a person's identity, tearing away pieces of their life little by little until one day it seems like the hope of a happy future is gone and there's no chance of getting it back. Here at St. Gregory Retreat Centers, we can assure you that there is hope. Our unique approach to recovery begins with the understanding that the dysfunction and damage caused by addiction can be overcome, not just dealt with. Don't let another day go by. Call St. Gregory today. Whether you're 10, 25, 50, 80 years old and beyond, everyone needs to live within their means. I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America. For almost a quarter of a century, we've helped people of all ages learn to manage their personal finances to benefit them far into the future. When problems arise, we've got the experience you need to make those debt problems go away. Got financial problems? Call Consumer Credit of America. If Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of America was your personal webmaster, Tom would filter out all bad debt emails. If Tom was your mailman, you'd never get any debt reduction junk mail. If Tom Coates was a lineman, he'd block any phone calls offering to reduce your credit card debt. Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America, and we're still your best choice for credit counseling. We're local, we're accountable, and we can do more. You make the call when the time's right for you. When it comes to competition, there really is none for Consumer Credit of America. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Shalom. Welcome back to Understanding the World with Rabbi David Kaufman. I'm joined in the studio by Mark Finkelstein, the Jewish Federation of Greater Des Moines, 
Uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Ronald Bergman and Bergman Folkers Cosmetic Surgery and Spa for his sponsorship of the show uh, today. And we're joined on uh, Skype uh, from Jerusalem by Arnold Roth. Welcome, Arnold. Arnold, are you there? I'm speaking. Welcome. How are you doing? How are things in Jerusalem today? Uh, sunny and beautiful, as, uh, as it normally is. Wonderful. Well, um, can you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? I, I uh, kind of gave a little bit of an introduction um, when I uh, introduced the show earlier. Um, but uh, uh, tell us a little bit about the work that you do um, dealing with uh, terrorism and I guess what you do in your professional life a little bit, too. Sure. Um, my professional training is as a lawyer, and I practiced law right up until the time that I brought my family here to Israel in 1988 from Australia. Uh, I have practiced law since then, but most of the time I've been involved in the uh, professional side of my life in running technology companies. So I've, I've been the, uh, the chief executive or um, uh, chief operating officer of uh, six uh, technology companies, and uh, technology has been as I guess you know, a big part of uh, the economic growth of Israel in this last uh, 15 or 20 years. But uh, much more significant from the point of view of uh, our conversation and uh, certainly in terms of my life is the fact that uh, both my wife and I have been uh, very active as spokespeople for uh, the voice of uh, terror victims. And this arises from the fact that our daughter Malki, who was 15, was murdered in uh, the center of Jerusalem in August 2001. Uh, in addition to what you would imagine to be the, uh, the overwhelming nature of an experience like that, it's endlessly shocking to us that people understand so little both about the experience of terror victims and of terrorism. Yeah, and we're, we're sitting here in the aftermath of the Boston terror bombing uh, in, 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 last week. And um, I know a lot of the people are in, in America are trying to deal with that and, and what it would be like for them to experience that. And we see on, um, on the air interviews with some of the parents of people who were involved and things like that. What what do you um, do you think that people really need to understand? What is it that you want people to know about the experience of, of victims of terror and families of victims of terror? Um, how many hours did you say we have? <laughs> yeah, so I understand it's a, a little bit, but yeah, no. So the, 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 the what I need to do before I I try to come to terms uh, for the purposes of a discussion with another person is to try to figure out how best to uh, say what needs to be said without losing the audience. Yeah. Uh, I say that on the basis of a lot of experience. The first thing to say is that the act of terrorism is essentially an act of hatred. And it doesn't do any of us a great deal of good to try to seek what journalists love to call root causes. That's not to say that there aren't root causes. There are root causes for everything in life. However, the uh, and and I'll take the Boston Marathon uh, killings as a as a kind of a case in point. Um, people somehow look right past what's obvious about those killings that it had to do with a, a religiously framed outlook on life and various uh, consequences that the perpetrators, the alleged perpetrators, I guess we need to say at this point, um, uh, what they had in mind uh, when they set out to do it, uh, and instead have reached for um, the, the miserable nature of the integration that the family suffered in the United States. Both sides of that statement, that is the, the religious side of it and the miserable nature of the integration, are true. The issue here is how much value are we going to gain from delving into this, uh, this dreaded concept of root causes. Because what experience teaches us is that uh, because we, most of us, have an essentially optimistic nature, and when we sit down on the subway or the bus uh, or in the football stadium and 
think, if we think at all, about the person sitting next to us, our inclination is to say, decent fellow, decent woman, until proven otherwise. But the reality is that more and more, there are people around us who are not decent and actually would like to kill us and may, in fact, be planning to kill us. Uh, that's not to say that uh, I'm a, um, a person who walks around with, uh, with deep uh, tremulousness and uh, concern about where the whack on the side of the head is going to come from next. But on the other hand, you have to be particularly uh, obtuse in order to ignore the great waves of, of hatred, action-oriented hatred, that have uh, come over Western society. And they're coming over and again from uh, sources that are deeply, deeply enmeshed, enmeshed in terrorism. And uh, though it's beyond the scope of a conversation like this to try to understand the, the mechanical nature and even the ideological nature of the terrorism, it's enough to say that terrorism is really not the same as somebody having a grievance. Terrorism is an overwhelming, utterly destructive state of mind which is on the rise and not on the decline. Arnold, this is Mark as well. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. Good to talk to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. My question is, because at one time we associated the uh, perpetration of terrorism within Israel, but we've seen over the last 10 years at least, the uh, terrorists uh, strike for political purposes in, Ir in Iraq and other places in the Middle East. What, what do you understand by that? What, does, what do people need to know? Because, you know, when we see so much terrorism, it, it, um, it desensitizes the public. Yeah, look, I think it goes beyond desensitizing. I think that there's, uh, you know, let me frame my answer in a slightly different way. In watching the coverage on, um, on the internet, and uh, we have cable TV at home, so we actually have a window into American news programs, I'm struck how again and again the commentators, and to some extent also the people who they interviewed on the streets, are saying things like, how could this be? What brought these people to do this? This is so shocking. This was such a beautiful day, such a beautiful event, such a beautiful city, such a beautiful marathon. How could they possibly be thinking? And so on. Now, this really uh, makes me want to uh, take people gently, gently, politely by the shoulders and give them a really serious shake and say, are you not paying any attention to what's going on around you? The acts of hatred, the acts of terror that are turning people's lives upside down, that are exacting the most unbearable price are coming from people who are somehow deeply interwoven in the society in which you and I live, and their goals are beyond your comprehension. That is, unless you suspend pretty much everything you know about the development of civilization, about the aspirations that most of us have when we live with one another and live constructive lives and get on with building and with educating and with loving, you're going to miss the whole point about what's driving the terrorists, the ideological terrorists. And there are many, many, many of them. The, 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 the sad reality is that Boston was not an exception to the rule. It was the rule. Fortunately, there are some mechanisms in place that make it difficult for terrorist attacks like the one in Boston, or indeed like the one in Jerusalem took my daughter's life, that make it difficult for those events to happen at will. But you can be sure, you can be certain that the terrorists are looking for opportunities to do this again and again. They're doing it as we speak at this moment. Now, I know one of the uh, one of the things that you spend a lot of time and effort doing is tracking the funding and, and organizational structure and who's supporting these organizations that are promoting terrorism. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, first of all, I want to say that this is not anything to do with my day job, and I make that point quite uh, deliberately. Uh, my wife and I um, speak out because we're passionate and because having lost a child to a an act of terrorism, we're highly motivated, not because of any other consideration, certainly not because this is the way we earn our living. I spent yesterday in Norway. Uh, I've been to Norway before, but always under much more pleasant circumstances. I was invited to Norway because in Norway there's an emerging scandal uh, that stems from Norway's immense generosity. Norway is one of the major funders throughout the world of development aid. They provide unthinkable amounts of money, and thank God, Norway can afford it. They're a wealthy country, and they, if I may put it in this kind of uh, supercilious way, don't have too many problems at home. It's a great country. Uh, 
the parliament is in turmoil there because it's been uh, now the case for several weeks that somebody kicking around the evidence has discovered that among the assurances given to the, the Norwegian people about the really vast amounts of money that the Norwegians pay by way of aid to various parts of the Palestinian economy, there were a, month, a, a number of, uh, let's call them, uh, inaccuracies, very serious inaccuracies. Well, to jump to the bottom line, the Norwegians now realize that their money, uh, contrary to assurances given to them by uh, very senior politicians, most prominently the former, prime, uh, former uh, foreign minister, has been applied towards precisely the kind of attacks that we've been talking about up until this point in the conversation. The Norwegians are providing money which is ultimately spent by the uh, Mahmoud Abbas regime, the, the friendly, liberal, positive uh, side of the Palestinian Authority government, um, to create an unprecedented scheme in which terrorists, I don't mean alleged terrorists, I mean convicted terrorists serving lengthy prison terms, are paid rewards, paid salaries. Now, it's a discussion which requires a lot of uh, uh, distinguishing between I didn't mean this and I did mean that, and we won't have the time to do that. But what it comes down to is a set of two conflicting claims. On the Norwegian side, the people who are looking to defend this are saying, well, the Palestinians have assured us that the money never goes to reward terrorists. It's a kind of a safety net. It's a social payment that enables uh, this society to pick, it up, pick itself up and, uh, and overcome generations of adversity but if you look and you don't have to be very uh, persistent about this into the way Palestinian Arab society itself addresses the subject of its terrorist prisoners those who are sitting in Israeli jails you'll see that the payment to them is considered to be part of the great regard actually of the idolization of the terrorists and especially those who have killed many Jews. The more Jews you've killed, the higher you are in that, in that, uh, on that totem pole. Uh, I was there yesterday because, as it happens, the man who built the bomb that was inside the guitar case that was being carried by the religious lunatic who walked into the Sabaro restaurant in, uh, on the 9th of August 2001 was built by a man called Abdullah Barghouti, a member of the notorious Barghouti clan of whom there are several representatives sitting in jail. He's now being paid Abdullah Barghouti, a man who killed 67 people, all of them Jews, he's now being paid four times the average salary of a PA civil uh, government worker. It's deliberate. It's part of a major statement being made to Palestinian Arab society. This is what we aspire to. And the Norwegians are having to figure out what their participation in all of this means, and I was there to help them. Uh, Arnold, there's a seeming disconnect that well-meaning people, for instance, uh, liberals in the United States, want to help people, but when they ally themselves with ideological fanatics in the Middle East, they're supporting causes that they wouldn't support in terms of repression of individuality, of, of women's rights, etc. How does this seem to you? Well, uh, first of all, Mark, I want to say that most of the, uh, the impulses I have in life, I think, are liberal impulses. I consider myself a person who's always been guided by liberal values. Um, however, once your child has been murdered by jihadists, it's, uh, it's what people call a great concentrator of the mind. And one of the things that it leads you to do is to look past the, uh, the empty words. There's a lot of empty words starting right on the day that, that Malki was, was killed, uh, was murdered. Uh, people, people are constantly looking for uh, explanations as to why people do certain things. And almost always, uh, ending up with an explanation that is reasonable, understandable, makes the other person seem like me, myself. But the reality is that we have people who are being drawn from a society that is being run along lines that are really beyond our comprehension. That is, unless we really work hard at it, we're not going to understand. We can understand, but it requires a real effort. 
when you look at the people who threw those uh, explosives into the crowd in Boston, then I could say exactly the same about literally hundreds of other terrorists uh, whose stories I know and you probably also know, then you discover that something really sinister and horrible was going on in their lives for a long period of time. It's only when you start to confront that to see just how differently they look at life, at the basic values, at, at the joys of being a parent, at, at, at the affection you feel for strangers, the desire to do good. And then, and then you read statements like, uh, we want the Israelis to know we love death just as they love life. You need to, t which is a real statement, you, you see it all the time, you need to take these differences into account. So as important as it is for the world to be sustained by liberal values, the reality is that much of the world is not only not liberal, but actually being driven by the, the most uh, grotesque forms of hatred that find their expression in things that we must stop at all costs and uh, terrorism is really all about the struggle to understand that we're going to have to take a short break here it's, uh, we're joined uh, from jerusalem by arnold roth and uh, when we get back from our break um, we can talk a little bit about the motivation of of bombers we were having a little bit of the discussion uh, about that uh, earlier on and and uh, i've been engaged in a discussion uh, about that with some people uh, locally here, as a matter of fact. So we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get back from break. Thank you. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. Oh, I brought uh, along a couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I'm Administrative Manager. I'm the Senior Technician. From Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. You just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture um, that we're going to do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do. And if we guarantee it's going to be a good experience for you or else it's free, what type of work do you think we're going to do? <laughs> there is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee, all of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we'd fail and we can't make it right, we guarantee all of those guarantees with a 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you going to say that to a client? No. <laughs> you don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're going to be listening. They're going to want to know what your challenges are. Then they're going to come and give you options, and, and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, and your family, you know, you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it, because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now, and then leave, and then come back, charge you again, and, and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I want to find why it failed today. How can we change the part today with something that you're not going to have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me. But is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after the technicians are there. They're just in awe. They're like, wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did is perfect. It's great. <laughs> Keep going, though. I like this. <laughs> just give us a try. I'm going to take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do. I mean, fixed right or it's free or 100% money back. Enough said. Shalom. Welcome back to Understanding the World with Rabbi David Kaufman. I'm joined in the studio by Mark Finkelstein of the Jewish Federation of Greater Des Moines. And we're joined on, uh, by Skype uh, from Jerusalem by Arnold Roth, uh, who is uh, talking to us about um, his understanding of 
of uh, terrorists and terrorism. And, and Mark had a question for you. Yes, Arnold, you were pointing out that most people have to look beyond certain things in front of them in order to see th what's actually happening and that you're, you're arguing essentially that there is a, a general illiberality in the ideological parts of the world that makes it different for people to, uh, to see what's going on. In the United States, oftentimes we see a justification put out. When, when something happens to, to Israel <clears throat> and there is a massive loss of life there, what we hear is, gee, that was terrible, but... And then our adversaries go on with a litany of complaints that were, it's almost a springboard of, of bad things that happen that allows them to do this. What, what do you see in that regard as well? Uh, it's an astute comment, uh, uh, Mark. The, um, the general perception is that uh, when everything that is going on in the world that's bad is presented to you through the, uh, the rectangular box in your living room, uh, or I guess these days via the internet, there's a certain remoteness about it. And uh, when you become part of the news, it, it takes on an entirely different shape. And that is, things are a lot easier to understand, at least you think you understand them, when it's being done to somebody else. Uh, when you've got to confront these things yourself, things look very, very different and you reach different conclusions. Now, one of the most uh, shaking aspects of life after the murder of, of my daughter has been getting to know terror victims in other places. Uh, I, could, I could really talk about many, many uh, anecdotes, I could give you many anecdotes about uh, meeting people and, and getting into discussions with them, but there's, there's one overarching message that comes through and has come through from the very beginning uh, over this entire period of 12 years. What we have in common transcends what makes us different uh, as people living in different societies. Well, let me say that a little more precisely. People who have experienced terrorism at, 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 at first hand have so much in common with people from other places, other cultures, other political systems, that it's really breathtaking. The part that's breathtaking is the way in which we, the people who have gone through it, get it. And for the most part, the people in the societies around us, and that includes people on my street, people, I, I use the word my in a, in a universal sense here, but I actually mean my in the Arnold Roth sense as well, people on my street, people in my family, people with whom I work, people with whom I come into contact, and certainly people in my government. Uh, the experience of undergoing this personally um, has some quite shocking dimensions to it that are not at all well understood. It's isolating, it's frightening, it's offensive. Uh, at the end of the day, it almost always means that you're left without a voice. And just to wrap up a long and complicated answer, and that's part of the reason, maybe the main reason, why Frimit, my wife and I, have uh, made every effort, and continue to make every effort, to go out there to be heard. We know how to speak and we know how to write, at least in English, and we want to make sure that at least our voices can be heard, and if possible, we'd like to speak in the name of other people as well. Arnold, um, the conversation here lately has been one of trying to explain how um, the, the, the bombers in Boston were oppressed and, and how they responded um, out of uh, kind of anger, frustration, being ostracized, um, that kind of discussion. You were talking about uh, having kind of a different mindset with different, different sets of values and and different value of life and that kind of thing. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, you know, Rabbi Kaufman, I'm going to be a little bit hesitant in the way in, in the things that I say because there's actually no way to know the degree to which an audience comes prepared for a serious discussion like this. So what I'm about to say is certainly my viewpoint, but it's only part of my viewpoint. Uh, the first thing to say is that uh, as true as it often is that the people who have actually done the terrorism have aspects in their lives that are complicated and unpleasant, it's also overwhelmingly the case, overwhelmingly, right across the world, that when you look at the lives of the people who carry out the acts of terrorism, they're very often people of privilege. Uh, and and I, I personally, the statement that expresses the point I'm trying to make the best is that in almost every case that I've looked at, the terrorist lived the happiest moments of his life 
at the moment when he killed other people and in some cases surrendered his own life. Now, you've got to understand what that might mean. I mean, it could be that I'm wrong. I don't think I'm wrong. I'm, I'm quite sure that I'm right, but it's natural that other people will think that I'm not. If I'm right, though, there's something devastating going on. It's almost as if a new kind of human being has been spawned. Of course, the more you look at it, you realize it's not so new that the impetus for self-destruction or of bringing immense pain and, and destruction and death on other people is not new, it's, it's very old. And again and again, what you see is that it's not the misery, but it's the insult that is motivating people. And there is an entire ecosphere out there of people who will find powerful, persuasive ways to convince other people that they are being insulted and that the right response to being insulted is to strike back with enormous pain, even if you surrender your own life in the doing of it. Now, it's obvious that I'm skirting around some really uh, potent and, uh, and complicated issues regarding uh, aspects of Islam that uh, are widely discussed in the media. The discussion is often not very productive, and I personally am as careful as I can be to not create uh, a, 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 a misleading sense of what I personally feel and what I think to be true about Islam. Um, however, the reality is that huge swathes of the Islamic world are today under the influence of messengers who say, you are being offended, your God is being offended, we the people are being offended, and the only thing that the people doing the offense understand is the sword. Now, people who don't like what I just said will dismiss this as being whatever they may characterize it as being. I will say that to ignore this, to not recognize that this is behind acts of destru destruction that have taken place in Indonesia, in Australia, in the United States, in France, in Spain, I, the list goes on, is to really live in a, in a rather um, self-deluding world. And uh, one thing I can say about losing a child to an act of, of hatred, losing a child to an act of murder, you, uh, you tend to try to avoid self-delusion because suddenly the stakes have, have become much higher. I've got to point out that Maki was the, the middle child in a family of seven. We have seven children. We, we say today that we have seven children. Maki was the fourth. She came after three boys and before three girls. So she was, she was uh, always uh, fond of describing herself as the meat in the sandwich. Uh, but looking back now, we realize that she was actually the glue that held the family together, and she was the reason why uh, life seemed to be going along so beautifully for us. She was just an endless source of joy. Losing a child under any conditions, but certainly in our case, losing Malky, whose, whose life was so precious to us, uh, it causes you to, to recast your thinking on so many issues, so that when I speak about what I think uh, is motivating the terrorism and, and, and the bridge that I see that connects the, uh, the two accused bombers in Boston to the bombers in, in, in Bogota and in Madrid and in New York and in Jerusalem and in Bali, uh, it's because I've learned that these are not miserable people. These are angry people, offended people, people who have been persuaded that the only response is a response in which other people pay a very heavy price. Arnold, any of the topics you're touching upon can be expanded for, for hours and to, to write chapters and books upon. So we're sorry that we don't have enough time to unpack everything. Uh, one of the, the questions I wanted to ask you is about the opportunity you had in 2004 to uh, address the International Criminal Court about the security barrier. Uh, it, it's not precisely uh, the case. It, it's true that I was the leader of the delegation of Israeli families who went there, but uh, perhaps it won't surprise you to know that actually the, the uh, International Court of Justice, the ICJ, uh, was actually not interested in hearing us at all. It was a highly uh, legal and arcane hearing in which uh, Israel was brought to account over the construction of the security barrier. Now, I, I, I don't mind saying what the basic case is that we went there to present, and the uh, and then perhaps you might want to take us in a different direction. But our case was, and is until today, that Israel is the target 
of an unprecedented war of terrorism calculated to exact maximum pain from ordinary civil society, from civilians. It's not a military campaign, and uh, it's stating the obvious that the Sabaro restaurant at the corner of King George and Jaffa was not a military target. It was a hit because, and not despite the fact, that it was filled with women and children. Uh, and yet, the whole framework of the discussion in The Hague was about the oppression of the Palestinian Arabs by Israel and the deep offense being caused by a barrier that is 97 or 96 percent uh, basically wire fence and uh, three or four percent um, uh, cement. The reality, which anybody can see if they're willing to look at it, is that the barrier, which is still not complete, has made a major contribution, among many other contributions, to reducing the number of people killed and maimed. That cannot possibly be a bad thing. Arnold, we, we, uh, we know and we read on your, your uh, biography about Karen Malky also. Can you say a few words about, about that effort? We, we've talked about uh, working with people with disabilities and supporting people with disabilities in the past, and I think at least some of this audience might want to know about what else you're involved in and have been involved in in honor of your daughter. I'm always uh, pleased to uh, get the opportunity to say those things, and uh, and I'm, I'm I'm glad that you've decided to give me an hour and a half to talk about it because uh, that's what it's going to take. No, but I understand that I've got to be very brief. The youngest of our seven children was born perfectly healthy, but uh, um, became very sick and, and eventually catastrophically injured in a in a hospital uh, accident, if you can call it that. And as today, she's 18 years old and she's blind and has no communication with the world. Uh, Malki adored her youngest sister and uh, showed uh, understanding that is even today I think mind-blowing, uh, understanding of how you relate to a, to a child, a sibling, uh, who will never give you anything. It was all one way. And Malki's love of her own uh, very disabled uh, sister, who, who, uh, who is no less disabled today, uh, translated itself into activity that she took on in her school and in her youth group. She was a leader in the Ezra youth group, which is a known, well known in Israel, not so well known outside of Israel, and eventually became what I would call an agent for change. And then she was murdered. And in the, in the process of picking up the pieces, and in fact, literally during the shiver, we sat as a family, we decided that we needed to honor and, and memorialize Malki's life by doing something that captured her spirit. So we created the Malki Foundation, the word Karen, of course, means a fund or foundation, and Malki is, of course, her name. We created that immediately. Uh, I, I was working as a lawyer in those years and had one of my partners uh, create a foundation, and the um, Israeli office that issues the certificates for those foundations issued it 30 days later, which was uh, the uh, 11th of September 2001. In the morning of that day, we got the certificate uh, establishing Karen Malki, and later that day, we, we got to see from up close and what it meant uh, when the world is uh, plagued with terrorism. So we've always connected Karen Malki's activities and, and existence to the events of 9-11. In, in, in the most brief of forms, Karen Malki provides support for families who are raising a seriously disabled child in Israel, not Jewish families, not Muslim families, not Christian families, families. And we make absolutely no distinction, of course, according to religion or, or any other characteristic. The distinction we draw is, is this child seriously disabled and does this child sleep at home every night? In other words, if the child has been handed off to institutional care, we wish you well, but there's a lot of support for institutional care in this country. There's almost no support for families like us who choose to raise their very disabled child at home. So Karen Malki now, uh, 12 years later, has uh, quite, a, quite a nice uh, record uh, we were uh, we were honoured just last week by being uh, one of the focuses of the national commemoration of Yom Hazikaron Memorial Day in a ceremony uh, at the Knesset in which a video of um, uh, summarising what Karen Malki has done was shown and, and seen in almost uh, in, in almost Isra every Israeli home. What we do is we provide funding for therapies, non-medical therapies, physical, occupational, speech, horse and water therapies, and we provide equipment equipment up the wazoo, as much equipment as a family who is caring for a very disabled child at home might, uh, might need. This is our way of both remembering Malki's life and keeping ourselves sane. My wife and I are the founders, we are definitely not the executives 
of the organization. We have a professional team that run it. Uh, whenever I travel for my work, I raise money for Karen Nalke. Uh, we have a website. If, I'm, if I may, I'd like to just sure. say the URL. It's www.malki.com. Uh, Foundation, one word, dot org, malkifoundation.org. Uh, we raise uh, money from Mums and Pops. It's one of those organizations. Uh, thankfully, we do have some other large foundations who are giving us support. But it's, it's an empowerment exercise. We empower the families. Uh, I can't think of a more appropriate way to react to the hatred, uh, the, the phenomenal hatred, the ongoing hatred that characterizes the people who, who stole Malky's life from us and from the world. It's, it's a highly appropriate response. And, and this organization, I know um, I, I saw it works with um, uh, Israeli Muslims, Druze, Christians, Jews. Uh, what does that kind of, that kind of interfaith cooperation um, uh, show and, and how do you feel about that kind of work? And Mark, Mark and I do a lot of that kind of work here. And, and we take pride uh, in, in our partner region in Israel as the Western Galilee uh, for our Jewish Federation here, and that they also do that kind of work that brings together uh, all the different uh, groups in Israel. I think it's something that people don't know about Israel, and they don't know about Israelis who do that kind of interfaith work. So the interesting thing uh, um, that, that will escape the attention of many is that you can walk into any Israeli hospital Dafka Hospital, specifically hospital, and on any day of the week, and you will see the way uh, that very natural interaction works. There are Jewish doctors and there are Muslim doctors. The, uh, I have to say the life of one of my other children who had a medical emergency was saved by a man who is a very proud, politically active Palestinian Arab working in one of the best hospitals in, the, in this uh, country, Shari Tzedek. Uh, the interaction that you see in hospital is ultimately the interaction of ordinary human beings dealing with challenges in life. Uh, and the natural nature, the naturalness of that interaction is, is a surprise for people who are raised on a CNN version of what life is like here in, in the state of Israel. So from our point of view, it's not we don't perceive it as interfaith. It's simply reaching out to empower families, whoever those families may be, who are raising and caring for a seriously disabled child at home. The fact that uh, about a third of all of the families to whom we've provided support in these 12 years um, happen to be drawn from, from the Arab and Druze sectors of Israeli society is a reflection of the fact that that's where the burden of caring for a disabled child also happens to fall. And to us, it's no more significant than that. I don't want to say that we get together around campfires and talk uh, politics. We don't. In fact, the essence of Karen Markey's work is not to interfere in the life of the families, but to stand there to support generally the parents. The parents of the, of the party, the agents, who are generally infantilized, it's a strong word, but it's, I, I say it with some authority, infantilized by the, the system here in which power is taken away from them instead of being given to them. There's no, no one who can do a better job of raising a disabled child than the parents. And we're there to provide them with that support. So. If you, if you want to call it an interfaith activity, I won't argue with you, and I'm, I'm very much in favor of such activities, but it, isn't, it doesn't have that nature. It's just a natural consequence of trying to do good in a society that has these many dimensions in it, which is what Israel is. Oh, uh, do you have your own, your own blog, Arnold, that we, we should refer people to? Um, Fremont and I write a, a blog together. It's called This Ongoing War. Dot blogspot dot com. This ongoing war is one word. Dot blogspot dot com. We don't there talk about um, doing good for families who are raising children who have disabilities. We talk there about the silliness that infects the international discourse over terrorism. Uh, unfortunately, there's plenty to write about. Uh, it's uh, we see we conceive of ourselves as being not political but very angry about the 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 imbecility that that characterizes the global debate about terrorism, and uh, we try to express it there. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to mention that as well. You're welcome, absolutely. What, what a lot of the topics that we talk about on this show have to do with the peace process, and, and, and uh, Senator, uh, Secretary of State uh, Kerry um, is trying to push uh, for, for talks right now 
um, a lot, and uh, I know a number of uh, other countries are, are hoping that the United States is going to get some progress on talks. What you, what is your feeling about the prospects of that? We we've we have our doubts here that things will move forward very well. Um, but what do you think is going on, uh, and and uh, what do you expect to see happen in the in the near future? Uh, it would be overstating things to say that I'm optimistic. I think that, like most Israelis, and here I do feel like I speak for many Israelis, uh, I'm I'm realistic and uh, depressed at the basic landscape that we see around us when it comes to uh, uh, building uh, uh, understanding between. The, the two sides, because there's more than just the two sides, there are multi sides to all of this, but if you look at the Palestinian Arab side, uh, it's striking how one part of it, I mean, we have a two-state solution already, that is the Hamas state and the and the Mahmoud Abbas state, and uh, as between those two, the differences are more, are less significant than what they have in common. Uh, both of them are giving all of the signs that they're interested in victory much more than they're interested in peace. Uh, in the case of Hamas, they believe that they're well on the way to victory. Uh, in the case of the Palestinian Authority, I think that the same motivation is, is there. I certainly see it in the speeches of uh, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, but perhaps he doesn't have quite the confidence that he's on the road to it. Uh, rather than talk politics, uh, which I'm happy to do, but I, I, it, it, not, not today, not now, I, I'd like to throw out a very small anecdote that happened to me yesterday. Uh, and I'm going to be a little bit... Um, uh, uh, careful about disclosing too much because this was very much not for the record. But one of the senior politicians in the Norwegian, I spent most of the day in the Norwegian parliament, um, and one of the senior politicians there uh, was approached by the journalist, a very well known journalist if you're a Norwegian, uh, who explained to him whom he was interviewing, which was me, and uh, asking to see if the politician might be interested in joining the discussion. Most of the people I was talking with were politicians, but it was not. The discussion that reached this particular politician is quite senior. The senior politician said to the journalist, well, I'm, I'm interested to see that you're talking about uh, Israeli victims of terrorism, but you know, you're falling victim to the process in which the occupier dictates the discourse. The journalist who, as far as I can tell, is not infected with any particular viewpoint on the Middle East conflict was shocked, as he told me. Uh, what had just happened in that brief exchange was that when confronted with a very human issue, the issue of parents mourning, burying their loved children because of a, an act of murder that while it did not identify the child personally, intended to reach children just like that child, when confronted with the people who speak in the name of those victims, this man's knee-jerk reaction was to fall into a paradigm in which the Middle East conflict can only be understood once you grasp that there's a strong side, therefore the evil side, and a weak side, therefore the virtuous side. He was shocked by it. I wasn't shocked, but I was, I was plenty angry because people like that stuffed shirt, uh, prominent Norwegian politician actually dictate the, uh, the agenda for the day. They do it in a number of ways. In the case of Norway, it has a lot to do with incomprehensibly large amounts of money that they channel into causes that they want to see encouraged. There's something really seriously wrong about this. The man who made that idiotic statement, that shameful statement, that disgraceful statement, is showing an absence of understanding of this complex problem instead of what he would tell you he's showing, which is a deep understanding. It's, it's plain to me that when people characterize the Middle East conflict in terms of, uh, of a strong side out to oppress the weak side, a side that puts up concrete barriers, a side that engages in this thing called occupation, it, it, it leaves me uh, choking for air. I, I, I'm fed up with having to tell people, without getting into the, the, the politics of this, that when Yasser Arafat, one of the most disgraceful human beings who ever walked the face of the earth, when Yasser Arafat became the leader of the Palestine Liberation Organization, the sum total of occupied territories was zero. Uh, it's somehow a statistic, which is emblematic of many other points that all three of us could make in this discussion, that is lost on a, an entire generation and, and future generations 
of people who have become passionate about the Arab-Israeli conflict without knowing even the most basic of, of the history. Yeah, we're, uh, we're talking about uh, liberation theology today uh, in my uh, class that I'm teaching on anti-Semitism and that, that idea of the need to support the weak against the strong um, uh, comes from a, uh, a Christian point of view, a uh, certain Christian point of view, that actually ends up leading to um, a lot of the boycott, divestment, sanctions um, efforts in, in Christian churches in the United States uh, and ends up um, uh, leading to a, a, a demonization of Israel because for the same reason you said, if the oppressed are good, the oppressor must be evil. And, um, uh, and, and so if you can put it into that context, it's very easy to engender hatred um, of, of Israel and eventually all Jews as, as connected to Israel. Um, that's been my, uh, my perspective, my understanding on it. And it's, it's, it's pretty amazing to see, um, as you just said, what kind of people, senior politicians, um, who share these views and, and will put forth these views as if it's perfectly normal. Um, uh, so uh, it's, it's, um, uh, it's difficult to hear, uh, I guess I, I would say, that, that, this is, that this is ongoing. Mark, did you have, you have any other well, No, that, just the, the fact that we have to wrestle with this problem of uh, stereotyping the situation and the, the number of people who actually gravitate to that uh, idea is, is astounding. And, and we see this among not people who we would say are, are on the political right, but this is definitely a philosophy on the political left. Um, and I think it's, uh, I tend to believe that it's at the heart of, of uh, anti-Semitism on the political left. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Uh, w without actually grappling with the point you just made, I think I can make a valuable point that um, is kind of analogous to it. Um, part of the satisfaction that I get, maybe it's a strange word to throw in a conversation like the one we're having, but there are aspects of it in which I get satisfaction, is in being a first person a witness to various truths that very often haven't occurred to the people whom I'm addressing. One of them has to do with the, the woman who engineered the massacre at the Sabaro restaurant. Most people that I've spoken to actually don't have a clue about the things that I'm about to say as briefly as I can. I will say them briefly. Uh, they, they confront realities like the, uh, the massacre at Sabaro in ways that are essentially dictated by the media. Um, uh, even as I say that, I've, there's so many, so many stories that I want to tell you about that, but I'm going to confine myself, myself to this. The massacre was actually engineered by a young woman who was 21 years old at the time. Uh, she found the, the bomber and the bomb, which were one and the same, and uh, brought him into the center of Jerusalem and then left him there, giving him instructions to wait 15 minutes so that she could get away, and then she got away. She was the woman who read the news on official PA television that night. She was the newsreader on the PA TV and uh, she read the news that night from Ramallah without conveying the slightest sense that she, in fact, was the person who had done the thing that she was reporting on, the massacre of 15 Israelis in Jerusalem and uh, the maiming of another 130. The woman was subsequently caught and put on trial and convicted and sentenced to 16 life terms. And uh, the court made what is quite unusual in these circumstances, a recommendation that there never be any clemency or any uh, parole. Uh, she walked free in October 2011 as one of the 1,027 people who were freed as part of the price for getting back Gilad Shalit. And uh, she went into so-called exile, which, which was a bogus characterization. She was born in Jordan. She had been raised in Jordan. All her family lives in Jordan. And when she was freed, she was freed on condition that she goes straight to Jordan, which is what she did. So she's now living in Jordan, and uh, to, uh, to embody, to characterize this enduring hatred that I've been speaking about with you, she has become a lightning rod for uh, the passions 
could lead people to kill Israelis. And she does it in a very straightforward way. She has done it again and again on television in the freedom of Jordan and in other parts of the Arab world. She flies freely throughout the Arab world. She has been a speaker at dozens of rallies. I've got the videos. She says, I'm proud of what I did. What I did was right. Why would I ever want to apologize? If I have the opportunity, I will do it again. Now, that's not a message that puts her into the Arab equivalent of the Guinness Book of Records. That's a message which is mainstream. It's a message which is highly regarded <coughs> excuse me, and which is praised by political leaders. Now, people could have shut her up very easily uh, in the Arab world. Not only did they not shut her up, but she has her own television program, which goes out by satellite on the Al-Quds network throughout the world, wherever Arabic speaking people can be found. Subsequently, she was given the unthinkable, in my opinion, unthinkable privilege of being reunited with the man who she called her fiancé, whom she had either never met or met once, who was also her cousin, and they were subsequently married and she's now pregnant. She is a walking, living embodiment of the hatred, the enduring hatred that Islamism and today's Palestinian Arab political thinking engenders in people. Um, there was a cover story in the New York Times magazine just uh, three weeks ago about the village in which her clan, the Tamimis, uh, live. The entire village of Nabi Salah is called Tamimi, every last person who lives there. And she lived there briefly when she came to, uh, to uh, when she left Jordan to come to study uh, on the West Bank uh, in 1999. Uh, so she was actually part of Nabi Saleh. And uh, your, your, what you're seeing there in Nabi Saleh today, what you're seeing today in the pages of the New York Times captures the whole message that I wanted to convey in this, in this encounter with you today. You've got the New York Times proudly trumpeting a village which is engaged in non-violent resistance and confrontation with the Israelis. While in the Arabic version of the Wikipedia page written by the people of Nabi Saleh, they praise to the skies, not in English, in Arabic, the achievements of the 17 Shahidim, people who have given up their lives one way or another, usually in acts of terrorism, from the village of Nabi Saleh in the cause of defeating the Israelis. And uh, Akhlam Tamimi, the woman who engineered the massacre that took my daughter's life, is one of those people. So we're living in parallel universes. Sitting here calmly talking to each other across the internet, we're able to see that there are people with so much malevolence in their hearts that they don't hesitate to send one of their own into an Israeli restaurant just so long as he can take the lives of Jewish women and children, and preferably religious, because that was what she freely volunteered after the fact. They were looking for religious Jewish women and children, and they succeeded. On the other hand, you've got the New York Times, and they're not unusual, they're not a church, they're, they're the church, they're a meta church, they are the church from which many other churches take their lead, saying, no, it's the people of Nabi Salah who are the non-violent defenders, resistors, the honorable party, and the bad, they don't say this explicitly, but the message is very clear, the bad is the young men carrying those heavy weapons with the armor and with the tough attitude who gives so much grief to the people of Nabi Saleh. I think a case could be made for saying that the way in which Nabi Saleh, that village on the north edge of Jerusalem, is perceived by so many people outside this area, it's a microcosm of what is so catastrophically wrong about people's understanding of what goes on here every day. Thank you, Arnold, for joining us today. Uh, we probably will have to have you on at least one more time at some point to talk uh, more through this stuff. Um, you, you do a lot of great work and you brought a lot of understanding uh, for us today. Uh, we thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, this is Arnold Roth and uh, make sure you go to the Malky Foundation uh, and, uh, and uh, check out all the good work they do and uh, if you can make donation in um, Malky's honor. Thank you uh, for joining thank us you. today and uh, that has been Understanding the World with Rabbi David Kaufman. Thank you.